Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today I think we've got some rather interesting stuff to go through. My theory of lenses might be a little bit controversial, but hey, I'm not working from the point of view of theory down to the job. I'm working from the point of view of what I see on the job up through the lens to work out what's going on. Reverse engineering, in other words. Now, in the last session, we looked at the shape of the beam because as I've been doing some of this work with lenses, I'm becoming very, very aware that the shape of the beam is a very important factor to cutting efficiency. As I mentioned last time, the beam was only one part of the equation. The second part of the equation is the lens. And from everything that I observe, I perceive that lenses have got two characteristics. One is an engraving characteristic, and the other, which people don't talk about, is a cutting characteristic. People think that just because lenses focus down to a focal point, that causes cutting. Now, that just doesn't make any logical sense. And so consequently, that's where I started to disbelieve some of the things that I've been indoctrinated with for the past few years. A good example of what I mean is what you're seeing here. This is a piece of 26 millimeter thick wood, which I cut with a two and a half inch lens using just 70 watts of power. <laughs> now I'm not bragging about the fact that I'm able to do big things with something small, but hey, this is pretty impressive, isn't it? The fact that I'm able to cut 26 millimeter thick hardwood. But the more important thing is look at the shape of the cut. It's almost a straight line. And if you look at it a little bit carefully, you'll see that there is a little bit of a narrowing just at the bottom here. Now, it might be a little bit more difficult for you to see because there's scorching in the way. But if you look at it in reality, there is a sort of a, a parallel section that then over the bottom half an inch, it tends to taper just a little bit. And that cut has just about made it through. If I'd allowed the cut to go right the way through, it would probably have been a parallel cut. Now, that just doesn't make sense according to standard lens theory, because the beam is losing its power as it diverges below the focal point. Now, we've already established that destruction of material takes place by virtue of molecular vibration. The vibration gets greater, the temperature gets hotter, the, the material that we're making hot reaches a certain critical point where it cannot exist in its form, in this case wood, anymore and it has to convert to something else. It mixes with oxygen and turns into various oxides, it leaves a carbon film behind, it does all sorts of things chemically. But hey look, it's not doing anything chemically right out here where the beam should be. It's only happening right down the center of the beam. Damage is caused by light intensity, not by power. So we might be throwing 70 watts at this, but that doesn't mean to say I'm getting 70 watts of power down here. What I'm doing, I'm firing light intensity down that center point there to cause that problem. You may remember this diagram about the relationship between power that's underneath the curve and intensity, which is the height of the curve. So I've got double the area under this curve that I have under this one, but because I've got the same footprint, then I've been able to double the intensity from 50 to 100. And this is the crucial point that I want to make now. If I change the beam size from seven millimeters to nine millimeters, then what I've done, I've stretched out the base of the graph, but I've still got the same area under the graph. It begins to answer one of the other rather interesting questions that cropped up from time to time. Now there are people around with K40 machines which have only got 30 watts, and they can do quite interesting cutting with their machines. But with 30 watts? Yeah, but if you look at it very carefully, the reason why they're able to do is because their beam size might only be four millimeters. Because the beam size has got a much smaller footprint. So even though we've only got 
a small amount of power. We could, if we've only got a small beam, get a very, very efficient cutting machine. And that's what I'm beginning to find with my 30 watt RF machine. I can do things on that that I didn't expect to be able to do. But that's because the beam size is not nine or 10 millimeters as it is on this machine. It's only around about six millimeters. That's why I'm absolutely convinced that intensity is a key issue when it comes to cutting. Now, a couple of sessions ago, I was pretty brutal with the lens, I think, as you can see down there. Yeah, I did. I drilled a hole right through the middle of the lens. Why? Well, it was to start proving my theory that I have about how lenses work. Now, as I've told you many times before, I'm not an optical engineer. I'm not steeped in the nuances of how lenses work in finite amount of detail. I understand the basic principles, but go beyond that and I'm lost. But what I am is a very inquisitive mechanical engineering designer who observes things very acutely and says, mm, that doesn't make sense. So here you see on this picture how I believe lenses actually work. For these machines, we can only get spherically shaped lenses. Now, the thing about a spherical shape is that these rays that come from the outside of our beam hit the lens at an angle. And that angle produces internal refraction. Now, this has been a simplified diagram because I haven't put the refraction as it comes back into the atmosphere again. There is a double refraction when you have a lens operating this way round with the flat side down. But just for simplicity, you can clearly see that as the beam gets closer to center, the angle at which it contacts the surface of the lens changes. And so the refraction changes. And the general principle is that this spherical surface will focus the light to a focal point. Hang on. If the light focuses all to one point, how is it possible to do that. And that's been my big problem. It's not possible to cut below the focal point if the beam is diverging, which all these rays will be doing. So my idea is very simple, reverse engineer it. If I can do that with a beam, it must mean that there's some energy coming through the focal point, which doesn't stop at the focal point. In other words, there's a focal point down here that's not here. And that focal point can only come from a very thin beam of energy that's passing through the center of the lens. So in the last session, I set about trying to prove this rather radical idea. I drilled a hole right through the middle of the lens. And what happened when I did that? We start here with a five millisecond pulse of 70 watts from a one and a half inch lens that I'm testing. And we gradually increase the pulses up to 75 milliseconds. And after 75 milliseconds, this lens can pierce its way in that deep. Now, when I remove the center, you may or may not be able to just see about two millimeters of penetration here, as opposed to 14 or 15 millimeters of penetration here. Now, I think that's pretty reasonable proof that something significant is happening right through the central axis of that lens, which is causing cutting. Because if I remove the central axis, I basically destroy the lens's ability to cut. But on the other hand, when I tried to engrave with this lens, it engraved perfectly. So I haven't destroyed the lens. I've only destroyed one of the lens's properties. If taking the center of the lens away gets rid of this part here, I think I've proved my point. And if I have, then something rather interesting is happening as well. That, that 70 watts of power is being used to produce this Gaussian distribution. And the Gaussian distribution has got its maximum intensity 
just here at the top of the beam. And that's what I'm using to work through this central part here to produce cutting. That leaves us with a fascinating problem. What the hell is going on with all this other power that we've got in here? Well, that other power is obviously being used normally to come down onto the focal point. But then again, what we've also got is this disruption to our engraving by a little pulse of power that's passing right through the middle of our engraving. We definitely have two characteristics built into a lens. We've got an engraving characteristic which takes place just here and we've got a cutting characteristic which is dependent upon this protrusion of a different focal point depending on the focal length of the lens. And the focal length of the lens, as I discussed in an earlier session, is all to do with the shape of this curve. As we get to larger and larger focal lengths, this curvature, when we look at this little bit here, gets flatter and flatter, and thus the focal point gets further and further below the nominal focal point as we push the focal length of the lens greater and greater. That's something that you can do with a 4 inch lens, a normal zinc selenide 4 inch lens, but I did that with a 2.5 inch gallium arsenide lens, which has got a flatter profile because its refractive index is different to zinc selenide. I haven't got a 4 inch gallium arsenide focal length lens at the moment, but I've got one or two on order from China and when they get here we'll be able to test that and I suspect that that four inch focal length lens will act almost like a six inch focal length lens of zinc selenide material. So here's my idea at the moment of how I think a lens, how it performs. Now we've proved categorically that we can destroy the cutting function. Today what we're going to do is very gradually try and modify a lens and see if we can get rid of the engraving function first and leave the cutting function behind. In other words, we're going to try and do the opposite of what I did there. Now here I've got just an ordinary cheap PVD, plano convex. I think it's a one and a half inch and I'm just going to check that with my little bit of kit. So just pop that on there like that and drop that into my fixture. Now with a bit of luck I might be able to show you what that lens is. There we go, look we're coming into focus now. The focus of this camera is messing around with the focus of this unit because they're not, they're not one and the same. <laughs> All right. So when I look at that with my naked eye you'll see that it comes into the range of a 38.1 or a one and a half inch lens. So before we start messing around with that lens we ought to, if you like, check its standard characteristics. Okay, so I've got a very thin sliver of soft plastic here, which I'm going to just drop into the nozzle and probe it in to find out how deep the lens is from the face of the nozzle. And there happens to be about 32 millimeters. I'm going to do a focus test on this lens. And my focus test covers a range of eight millimeters. So ideally what I want to do is to set plus and minus four millimetres above and below the focal point. So therefore what I've got to do is start off with a gap of two millimetres so that I can finish up with a gap of ten millimetres. And that will give me plus and minus four millimetres on the nominal six millimetres that I'm looking for. Okay, well I'll just set the nozzle to two millimetres here we go. I always like doing the focus test on a piece of MDF because it gives really good clear results. So you remember we had a gap of 32 millimetres to the front of the nozzle. So we've now set the starting point to 34 millimetres for our test. And there's our results. We've got the focal point more or less where we expect it to be. That's the point at which 
all the power that's coming through that lens is passing. Now this next test determines how well the beam penetrates. So we set the focus up to six millimeters. So I've got the focal point set onto the surface now. Okay, and we're gonna run a series of timed penetration tests running from five to 75 milliseconds. 75 milliseconds to burn a hole in is a huge amount of time. Most of the time we want to be working down here at around about maybe uh, 5 or 10 milliseconds because that's the speed at which we should be cutting. So that means the penetration on here for those sorts of times it looks as though it's only around about maybe 4 or 5 millimetres deep. So there may well be a threshold beyond which we cannot use this lens to cut. It's a five millimeter lens, for example. Now, in the advancement of science, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of my rocket fuel because what we're now going to do is check what the beam size is that is firing at our lens. And we're going to do that by very carefully, hopefully, I've got full power on here. I'm just going to very gently pulse it and then oh, a little bit more. Now I don't really, that's what I didn't want to do, set fire to it, but I think we're okay. Let's just zoom in a little bit more. And what we should find is that the beam is still affecting the outside of that hole. But you can just see it's glowing around the outside of the hole. So we've still got power out at that diameter. I'm evaporating away some of my coffee, which is bad news. And as I hold it on, you'll see longer and longer on, on, on. Now for something that's supposed to be a four or five millimetre beam, that's, uh, that's doing a lot of damage, isn't it? Let's be conservative, shall we, and call it a nine millimetre beam. Now I'm going to have a little bit of difficulty trying to explain the next part of this concept that I can see in my brain. And we'll just carry out the lens test on this piece of material. Because this material is effectively the real world. Now, I think there is one more that really doesn't show here. Okay, but what it does show you is as the duration of the pulse increases. So, if you like, I'm getting a larger and larger beam diameter. That doesn't mean to say that the beam diameter changes on the back of the lens, because the beam will always be, especially if you're doing a continuous cut, the beam will be nine millimeters diameter, as we've just proved. In fact, it could even be more than that. Now, we've just seen the beam is about nine millimeters diameter, because if we're doing a continuous cut, then there's always going to be nine millimeters of beam firing energy at this top side of the lens. But the question is, how much of that energy is passing through the lens? Well, you can see here, it's only a very small amount of the total energy that's going to go through the lens. So it's only this central part of the energy that's on the back of the lens which is gonna make its way through because this is high intensity. That high intensity is not just on its own going to be able to cut material. We need intensity plus time. In other words, you can see here very clearly, we've got the same power beam all the way along these tests this one is exposed for five milliseconds, and this one is exposed for 75 milliseconds. In the same way that you can see here that time is affecting the amount of energy that's reaching the surface, the same will apply here. It's a mixture of intensity and time to do cutting. So if I've got this amount, if I've got this amount of intensity, as I demonstrated on here, I can cut through 26 millimetres at three millimetres a second. If I don't have this intensity, then I won't be able to cut through that, regardless of how much time I allow. The cutting is basically relying on two factors. Number one, and the key factor, is the intensity of the light that you can fire through the lens. And the second feature is how long you need to keep that intensity in one place to do damage. But focus also determines depth as well. 
I could keep this on for a huge amount of time, but I won't be able to cut any deeper than this depth here because I don't have the focal point to carry the power. If I want the focal point to carry the power, I've got to have a longer focus lens. Okay, so we're now gonna take our lens and uh, do a little bit of work on it. Now to do the work, what I've had to do is make a little jig. And basically this jig allows me to just push that lens in there. It's, it's held in by virtue of the friction on this plastic collar. Now the plastic collar itself has got a little bit of compliance, but what we're going to do now is take it across to my lathe. Okay, well I knew I'd be able to put my Dremel to good use one day, and also I've managed to make myself a little fixture to hold the Dremel on the lathe. That's great what a laser machine can do for you, isn't it? Okay, well what we're now going to do is to um, slightly modify this lens. We just set that up with a two millimeter gap exactly the same as we did before and we'll see whether we've had any effect on the focal point. Right, let's just see what we've done to its cutting power, should we? Well, I showed you the first test in this series. I'm now going to show you the last. Set the focus up to two millimetres again. And now you can compare the first and the last in the series. So we're all the way from probably 35, maybe up to 42, virtually the same thickness line. Where's the focus gone? Now I'm setting the lens to the same 6mm focus point that I've used throughout, even though it appears that the lens has lost its focus. But obviously nothing has changed, the focus is still technically on the surface. And here's what our final lens looked like. It was just a three millimeter diameter spot in the middle of the lens. So we all know the model of a focal point, how the rays come from the lens, come down to a narrow focal point and then open out again underneath the focal point. So we get a converging beam and a diverging beam. And at the focal point, we get the crossover where we get virtually the thinnest line that we can possibly get. And so the thinnest line in this set must be regarded as the focal point. And sure enough, we can see that the focal point was supposed to be 38 mil and is 38 mil. So the point is proven there that this is a normal lens that's working as designed and expected. But this is the same lens that's been modified. So the bit around the outside here is responsible for focusing the rays into a single point for engraving, just as we can see here. Okay, but when I remove that part which is focusing around the outside, I remove the ability to focus. And all we're left with is the ability through the center of the lens to transmit power, which if you remember last time, I did the opposite. I took the power away from the center of the lens with a hole. Well, this time I'm expecting to find the power coming through the center of the lens because that's what I've left behind. Here we've got that line thickness that I was showing you where a normal 38 millimeter lens starts off with a thick line, a thin line, and back to a thick line. And yet when I remove the focusing ability with this type of lens, look what happens to this green line. It's almost flat. It only changes by roughly 0.15 of a millimeter, the line thickness. Whereas in the normal lens, it changes by roughly about 0.6. So I think we can categorically state that we have removed the ability of that lens to focus. And then we look at what we've done to the power that comes through the middle of the lens.
this is the penetration that we got with our final um, iteration of this lens when it was at three millimeters diameter. Everything else was transmitting power normally. Okay, there's a little bit of variation, but the 18 millimeter lens is sitting somewhere in the middle of that pattern. So we're getting a little bit of plus and minus variation, which is anything to do with mine measurement and various other slight variations. But, but I think the net result that you conclude from this is that there is no reduction in power as I start reducing this diameter. The only time I experience a reduction in the power transmission through the lens is when I go from five millimeters down to three millimeters. I think that's pretty conclusive evidence between the two lenses. One that says we can't cut with that lens but we can focus with that lens and this one that says that we should be able to cut with this lens but not focus with it. And I think that clearly demonstrates that there are two distinct features within a lens. So I'm pretty happy in my own mind that this is how I now visualise lenses operating for cutting with these machines. But when you're engraving, you can assume that the normal focal point pattern exists. But remember that within that normal focal point, there is a little spike of energy which could annoy you. Because when you are trying to engrave, you normally only want to burn the surface. You don't want to dig into the surface. And this will cause you to dig into the surface. Now, I've got good examples of that when I tried to do some matrix burns to find out what colour I might be able to get at various speeds and powers on a machine. And yes, I can get lots of depth here, but if I look at it closely, what I shall find is turning that into sawdust, because that is not quite what it seems. So we've got lots of deep cuts like that as we put more power on and we make the beam sharper, even though this is an engraving lens, two and a half inch lens. So these are what you would class as a soft lens for engraving. Well, they're not that soft, are they? Because look, they're digging in like this. And what we're then doing, we're just burning the surface like that. So that's the color that you're seeing on the surface. But below the surface, what we're doing, we're actually using Look, we've got this spike of energy here which is doing this damage below the surface and then we're trying to engrave on the surface itself. So we're not putting all the energy into the surface, we're doing two sorts of damage. As I said, all of a sudden when I see this model, many, many questions that I've been looking for answers for for many years now are all of a sudden becoming so... they just fall into place. Now, knowing that there is no focus on that lens now, or virtually no focus, and what's coming out of it is a virtually straight beam of energy, I'm going to carry out another test, which will be interesting for people. I've got an angle block here, which I've set up to three degrees, um, but I've got a block of acrylic, a nice polished block of acrylic, which has got a nice smooth side down here and a clean top. So we've got somewhere to work. So what I'm going to do is set this to six millimetres. There we go, six millimetres above the surface. Even though there's virtually no focal point there, that's where it should be. Okay, now just inside the block, I'm going to try and punch a hole down at three degrees. What I'm now going to do is to move the block slightly off so that the beam is now bouncing off this front face here. Okay, now that looks absolutely perfect. Just the merest nick on that corner there. And then it's run down this surface here. And then look what's happened is buried itself in parallel to the other hole. This is now, here onwards, it started to dig its way in, and as you can see, it's gone completely under the surface. So I think that categorically proves that there is no reflection off of the surface of that material. The beam is eating its way in. It's doing exactly what we'd expect it to do. Anything in front of it gets evaporated.
It doesn't bounce off the surface. So I think that's another myth that we can put to bed today. Well, here we are at the end of a very long and I think fairly successful day. I think my theory of lenses has a lot of credibility. I haven't seen anything better that describes how lenses cut and why. We've also talked about the way in which you can either make your lens cut by having a very sharp beam or if you reduce the power of your beam you're going to blunt it. So if you've got a, if you've got a lens which has got a sharp point sticking out the bottom <laughs> as my model shows and you want to do engraving then generally the conclusion is that you wouldn't want to engrave at full power because even the bluntest lens, i.e. maybe a four inch lens, which you'd regard as possibly being a soft lens, isn't soft. It's still got a damn great big spike sticking right out the bottom of your focal point. And that's what you have to remember. There is no such thing as an engraving lens or a cutting lens. Lenses are a compromise. You've seen how I've been able to dissect the lens into its two separate parts and either make it cut or make it engrave. There are no special lenses at the moment that are engraving lenses or cutting lenses. That might change when one or two people see what I've done, but I don't think you'll ever be able to go out and buy a lens with a hole in it. We might do some experiments with that in the future for engraving. All I can say to you guys is thank you very much for your time and your patience and putting up with my ramblings. Um, I'm mad. Who else would do this sort of stuff? <laughs> but I enjoy it. And I hope you come along and enjoy it with me. So thanks a lot for your time and I'll catch up with you in another session.